join us on the Sox Machine podcast to help us preview the Houston Astros series. He's got a couple of podcasts. He's got Bleacher Blums with David Tuttle, part of the Blue Wire podcast podcast network. He's got Believe in Astros on the Believe podcast network. You could hear him call Houston Astros games. And he is the Game 3 2005 World Series hero for the Chicago White Sox. It's Jeff Blum. Jeff, thanks for joining the Sox Machine podcast and happy opening day. Happy opening day to you, too. I appreciate everything you're doing for all those White Sox fans. And, of course, it's always good to reminisce a little bit as we get ready for this 2023 season. So from a Houston Astros perspective, I want to start the conversation with its six straight appearances in the American League Championship Series. They're the defending world champions, and they are expected to at least reach the ALCS again in 2023. I think I speak for most of the American League, Jeff, when I ask – when are the expectations going to be too heavy for this organization and they slip and fall? Because it's just fascinating to me that we are realistically talking about the Houston Astros being the favorite again to win the AL West and be there as the team to beat in the American League Championship Series for possibly a seventh straight season. You know what? I wish I knew the answer to that because we've been through so much transitioning out here in Houston because it started – you know, right after those 2017, 18 seasons, you started to lose guys like George Springer. You started to lose the Justin Verlanders, the Zach Granke's, uh, Garrett Coles, you know, Carlos Correa's. And I mean, there's an all-star team that was on these ball clubs when this winning started that have now been moved on via free agency. Uh, they weren't able to keep some of those guys, some they were able to. But it's also a credit to how they drafted and developed in order to let those guys move on. But I don't think anybody anticipated a Jeremy Payne to do what he did, which is phenomenal. But at the same time, it's just it's a mentality. It's a it's an organization that's really created a culture of expectation of winning. And I think the way that the guys handle themselves at the 26 on the 26 man roster really kind of overflows into those levels below them so that when they do get to the big leagues, there's also that expectation and anticipation of winning and they all go about their business. It's 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 truly become um, at least from my vantage point, a machine. And that machine is just oiled by proving everybody wrong. And they just continue to use that. Yeah, not just they're the defending World Series champions. I think three of the minor league affiliates also won their championships last year. It was it was an incredible 2022 year for the Houston Astros. They win at every single level. And what's also fascinating, there's a new GM. So Dana Brown, former VP of scouting for the Atlanta Braves, because everybody knows that's what the Houston Astros needed, another excellent talent evaluator to join the front office. <laughs> what differences do you expect to see the Houston Astros operate under Dana Brown? Well, first of all, I knew it was a good hire when, it, like you just, you know, just kind of insinuated when everybody around the league went, good Lord, did they really need to pick this guy up? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, I think Dana's actually, you know, he, he, he comes from that scouting side of baseball and a lot of people who are into the analytics might say that scouting is a little archaic. And that's what I actually love about Dana Brown is that he does recognize and does embrace the scouting and scouting means putting your eyes on guys, seeing what they're able to do, what's their body movement like. And then if you like something, then you go over to the analytics side and say, does it match up? So I kind of like the way he, his philosophy is scout first, add the analytics and see if they match up and then we'll move on. But this is a guy I think coming over to this organization is going to do a very good job in, you know, in in being a little more aggressive. I think what we lost over the last three years was that aggressiveness because Jim Crane likes to win. He wants to win. He understands it sells tickets and merchandise. And he needs a GM that when he shows up and says, I want this guy, can you get him? Dana Brown's going to be that guy that's able to go out there and do it. But you also look at Dana Brown and where he came from, he did a great job in Atlanta. They developed wonderfully. They did a good job of trading for some key pieces, signing them to long-term contracts and using the free agent market. So he's, he's a nice mix in a situation where the Astros should be expected to be on the back, maybe the backside of this winning window, but he, he's in a good spot to make some things happen here. Yeah, the contract extensions, there's been early rumors about on that front that, oh my gosh, the Houston Astros are going to lock up everybody now. Is Kyle Tucker next? Is he the next one in line, do you think, to get a big deal from the Houston Astros and, and stay there for the majority of his career? 
If you would have asked me that right after the Jose Abreu signing and before we saw these massive Trey Turner type contracts going around the Xander Bogarts, mm -hmm. I would have said, yes, there's a possibility. But I think now with, with how some of this money is being spent and the years that are being asked for, I think there might be a little more work ahead for the Astros to accommodate what Kyle Tucker might be asking because Kyle Tucker is kind of that star on the rise in major league baseball. And they're lucky to have him for a couple more years under club control. But I think the idea of the shift going away, playing in this ballpark, uh, the, you know, the base is getting bigger in the, in the pitch clock kind of, everything kind of aims or angles in the direction of making Kyle Tucker, believe it or not, a better ball player. And I think he's kind of using those, those numbers to say, you know what, considering the contracts that are being handed out right now and considering my opportunity without the shift being implemented and the ability to steal more bases, I might be asking for a couple more years and a couple more bucks. Yeah. If Tucker plays more than 145 games, I think he's a legit dark horse contender to win the American league MVP right up there with Aaron judge and Jose Ramirez. I think we're going to see like a seven war season out of Kyle Tucker in 2023. You mentioned Jose Abreu. He's the elephant in the room for white Sox fans. <laughs> How does Abreu fit into this Astros clubhouse? How did the spring go for Abreu and what kind of impact are you envisioning Abreu will have on the Astros lineup? Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm extremely excited because being on the broadcast side and watching what Jose Abreu has been able to do in his career with the Chicago White Sox, you're going, good Lord, this guy's at the plate again with two more guys, double in the right center field gap, two runs score. This guy is, he's a beast in every sense of the word. Uh, you know, one thing I looked at was his uh, hitting with runners in scoring position, career 300 hitter, both with two outs and without two outs. So this guy has been consistent. He's a run producer. And now putting him in this Astros lineup where they have a high on base percentage, they have a tendency to pass that baton, so to speak, that nobody's really trying to do too much. And I think he fits this the the mold of what the Astros are trying to do beautifully. But everything I heard about Jose Abreu was off the field. You know, the work ethic, uh, his, you know, the cerebral approach to the game of baseball, understanding what you're trying to do at the plate. He, he's better defensively than I think most people give him credit for. He's only, he's going to get better, I think, here with Joe Espada working with him. And he, the thing that really surprised me is you're coming into a championship organization and these guys were excited to have Jose Abreu join the situation they're in. And then you hear the interviews from Jose Abreu where he's saying, I want to, I want to join a championship team. And here he is. But this guy was showing up at five o'clock in the morning, getting in the gym before some of the, you know, some of the core guys that have been here for a while. So he kind of established that early on that he is going to to mix in. He's not going to take over the reins. He's not going to put expectation on himself and he's going to go out there and rake and do what he's done. But he looks like he's in great shape. He looks comfortable. He looks happy. And that can sometimes be a scary thing when you move a guy like him into a ballpark like Minute Maid. From my perspective, he looks very motivated. The last time, Jeff, I saw him this motivated was 2020, and he won Oof. the American League MVP. Like, he, I think he's going to have a monster year. I think he's going to have a monster year. And he really uh, could. <laughs> White Sox fans are, that's what, that's what we're going to do. We're going to sigh a lot. Uh, bad news on the Astros front Jose Altuve. Yeah. That was an unfortunate injury in the World Baseball Classic. When do the Astros expect Altuve to come back, and who's playing second base when he's out? I'll, I'll attack the who's going to play first, you know, just it's an easy it's an easy question for the time being to answer. And right now you've got two options for the Astros. It's Mauricio Dubon. He's a little bit he's a little bit smaller, considerably smaller. I mean, David Hensley, who's the other option, is six foot six for crying out loud. He's he is a massive human and he wow. doesn't really fit the mold of that second baseman. But he has experience playing shortstop so he can play the middle position. And there's really two differences between these two guys. Dubon's a little bit uh, slighter, quicker, uh, better footwork, uh, can turn a double play, gets there in good fashion. Not necessarily a good stick to have in the bat, but if he can create contact and keep the ball in play, he could create some opportunities. But David Hensley, he's just a big guy. And you take away the shift and you start to rely on athleticism up the middle where you're going to need it. And that's where Hensley's kind of, you know, handcuffed a little bit because he is so big. So you're going to have to really keep track of where you're putting him on the field 
He may not play with a Framber Valdez or a Hunter Brown who are heavy ground ball guys. He'll be out there with a Christian Javier who hit, you know, gives up a lot of fly balls, a lot of pop-ups, try and protect the defense that way. But uh, offensively, he puts together a great at bat and he's got those big, long arms. He's got some decent power every once in a while to sneak one out. So you're going to have to pick your spots, you know, where where you put those guys in. But there's not that definitive guy that's going to go out there every single day. And for Jose Altuve, I'm hearing the surgery went well. But at the same time, if it's eight weeks before he can grab a bat, it may be another month after that before he can get on the field and actually play. Because it's one thing to to get the strength heal up mm -hmm. you've got to be able to grip the baseball you've got to be able to grip the bat and i do have concerns with that being the top hand the thumb that he broke that's the hand and that's the joint that absorbs all that impact when you're making contact well that mean with the white Sox and astros playing again in may that that might be the white Sox are lucky and they don't get to see jose altuve mm -hmm. in the 2023 season unless the two teams meet in the postseason for the Astros probable pitchers. We're going to see Framber Valdez on Thursday night, but Christian Javier is going to take the ball on Friday. I think everybody in major leagues knows well about Valdez. He's one of the best in the American league, but Jeff, can you talk about Christian Javier? Because I feel like he's one of the more underrated pitchers in major league baseball, and he could be primed to have a breakout season, much like we saw on the South side last year with Dylan Cease. No, you're exactly right. I mean, that would be a wonderful comp for a guy like Christian Javier to have that kind of comparison with Dylan Cease because Dylan Cease's stuff is off the charts and he is he's setting up for you know his own Cy Young run here in 2023 and we'll get to see that on opening day. But at the same time, Christian Javier is a guy that was kind of a, a swing man, would be your long inning reliever out of the bullpen, would give you a couple of spot starts. But last season, we saw him go out there and really start to chew up some innings and have some, you know, just some breakout performances. He started the no-hitter in uh, Yankee Stadium against the Yankees. He started that no-hitter that was in the World Series. So he's done remarkable stuff, but he's done it kind of in a quiet manner, and that kind of fits his demeanor. His nickname is El Reptile. He's just calm, cool, collected, doesn't sweat, just continues to come out there. And you see the ERA, you know, maybe in the you know mid threes, high threes. But the number that jumps is his strikeout rates. He does a phenomenal job of creating swing and miss when he's only throwing 93, 94 miles an hour. And you kind of wonder how or why, but he's a spin rate guy. His four seamer has some of the highest spin rates in the game. And what that does is it doesn't create that downward trajectory that you traditionally see. It'll actually kind of flatten out a little bit and ride through the zone. And you'll get a lot of swings underneath, a lot of pop-ups and create swing and miss. Um, in spring training, his slider looks good and he's developing a little bit better change up every time he goes out there. And that's part of what makes him so good is that he's unflappable and he's aggressive with the fastball in the zone that guys can't get to for some reason. No Lance McCullers in this series, which is a sigh of relief for White Sox fans because Lance is always terrific against the White Sox. What's the situation for Lance McCullers and what, when are the Astros hoping that he'll be able to rejoin the rotation? Um, I, th I think it might be sooner than it was last year. I think Lance, you know, he puts so much stress on that stress on that arm because he's got such good breaking stuff. But in order to get the spin rates that he does, there's obviously a little more torque than maybe the standard pitcher. Um, and Lance is also one of those guys that you want to have healthy, 100% healthy, because you can't go out have him going out there and finessing his breaking ball because he's going to lose a lot of his effectiveness. So I think the idea with Lance is, he recognized, you know, maybe the forearm or the elbow wasn't where he wanted it to be and decided to kind of back off on the throwing program, which tells me that he's going to work his basically work his ass off to get the muscles around that that joint stronger. And when he's ready, he'll start ramping up, getting on the mound and getting out there. But I haven't heard a timetable. I'm not going to speculate, but I know that Lance is going to be working really hard to get back on that mound. And once he does, and I, you know, that's also the idea too, is to make sure that when he does come back, he's ready to go because he is a vital part of that rotation that could create a lot of depth. When watching the Astros during spring training under the new rules, how did the team adjust to some of these rules? Did they struggle with the pitch clock? Are you seeing more stolen bases given up? Or are the, were the Astros more aggressive during spring training with the shorter bases? Or I should say the larger bases, but shorter base path. 
Yeah, I think they were. I think they were a little more aggressive as far as offensively. You're going to see Kyle Tucker try and push and go for that 30-30 season if he's able to do it. You know that'll obviously help his contract talks. <laughs> uh, you know uh, Jose Altuve, even at 32, 33 years old, still has pretty good wheels when he's healthy. He'll be able to run more. You know, but it's the it's the guys like the Chaz McCormicks or you know Jeremy Pena. Are they going to be able to create moments when they can take off and run a little bit? And that's what I'm kind of curious to see during the season too. Is can some of these guys run themselves into scoring position, which would benefit everybody? But I think with these new rules, with the pitch clock and that bigger base, you're going to put a lot of pressure on your on your catchers they're going to have to be able to react quickly to calling pitches but they're also going to have to be able to be very good at the catch and throw because these guys are going to be very tempted to start taking off and trying to take advantage of the shorter base path and that's where i think you know martin maldonado one of the best in the game of coming out from behind home plate throwing runners out he's obviously proven his worth beyond numbers because you ignore his batting average. He's so good behind the plate. So the Astros are in good shape in the sense that they have Martin Maldonado behind the plate. And hopefully, you know, some of what he does rubs off on Yiner Diaz. And now we're finding out Cesar Salazar is going to be the third catcher on the team. So it's kind of interesting to see what they do with some of that depth. And then finally, from an outside perspective, Jeff, what are your thoughts about the Chicago White Sox heading into the 2023 season? What are you expecting to see now? Because last time you and I, Chad, was on your podcast. We talked a lot mm -hmm. about Tony Russa. Tony's not here anymore. <laughs> it's Pedro Grafal. So what are your thoughts about the White Sox heading to opening day? I think the energy is going to be off the charts. And I really hope that the South side is excited about having Grafal at the top of that. Um, the pitching staff is great. I think that you, if you can get those guys to perform to their potential, you're going to be fine. The bullpen looks good. It's always a matter of scoring runs, but I know there's been some maneuvering as far as defensively, you know, moving guys around and maybe putting them in their natural positions, getting Andrew Vaughn a little more comfortable, but the White Sox are always going to hit and I, you're going to get Tim Anderson for a full year. Hopefully everything he's had off the field injury wise and personal wise, he gets out of the way and he's able to go out and play because I think he's the best player. I know Carlos Correa is in Minnesota. Obviously I have an affinity for him, but I've been on the Tim Anderson bus for a long time. And I still think he's, he might be the best player in that division. So I love what he's able to do. And if they can start getting around him and rallying behind what Tim's able to do, I think offensively they'll be fine. And secretly, I hope that everybody in Chicago knows this. I've kind of been on the back burner, kind of cheering for them a little bit. Obviously, the matchups in the in the postseason, I have to shift a little more towards the the uh, Houston side. But I've been watching the White Sox from afar, and I've kind of liked what Rick Hahn and those and those people have done over there to give uh, give the White Sox a chance to play in that Na American League Central, which should be a gettable division. It's always interesting because it just seems that they beat up on each other. But uh, I hope the White Sox do uh, get off to a good start and we can see some you know, fireworks down there on the south side. Well, hopefully not too good of a start for those Houston Astros fans that are listening. Uh, I know. <laughs> as the White Sox are at Houston for the first four games before heading home for their home opener against the San Francisco Giants. You can follow Jeff on Twitter. He's at Blummer27, and all White Sox fans should do that because he's a huge part of the White Sox winning the World Series in 2005. Jeff, again, happy opening day. Have fun calling the White Sox and Astros series, and we'll stay in touch as the Astros and White Sox again play in mid-May. Absolutely. I appreciate coming on, Joshua. Thank you, man.